Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today for another episode of The Future of Work with Jacob Morgan. My guest today, David Cody. He's the former CEO of Honeywell, and he's the author of a brand new book called Winning Now, Winning Later. I have the copy sitting right here next to me. There you go. Um, <laughs> Had a chance to read it. It was an awesome book. I learned a lot from it. So, David, thank you so much for joining me today. Glad to be here. So the, the very first question that I have for you is actually something that you talked about in the epilogue of your book. And huh. a lot of listeners are always really interested in, in the background of successful leaders. So can you tell us a little bit about how you grew up, where you grew up? Uh, it didn't sound like you were... Um, the type of person that you are now when you were a kid. You said you were lazy, <laughs> immature, and directionless. Yeah, and I may be understating that. <laughs> I, so uh, how, how did you grow up? Well, well, one of my learnings was I had a lot of ambition, but uh, apparently, and I had no idea how to realize any of it, though. And I grew up in this small French-Canadian enclave in New Hampshire called uh, Sunkark. And this is where uh, French Canadians had emigrated to uh, fill the textile mills that were popular in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And there really were no role models in town. My uh, mom and dad, uh, like, I, like I say, I was the first one to graduate from high school. My dad had six months, my mom had two days. And my mom always said she wishes they could have been a, a bigger help to me in terms of guidance and so on. But um, at the end of the day, I've told them their guidance was actually hugely helpful because both of them really taught values that ended up being really important later on. And I've said, I've been asked many times, what, um, where did you learn most of your leadership lessons? And they expect me to name some famous CEO. And I always say the same thing. It's, you know, my mom and dad, basically the stuff they taught, taught us all as kids, uh, still paid off later in life. So I grew up there and hated school. I was good at it, but I didn't like it. I didn't put any time into it. I nearly quit when I was a senior in high school, then um, got accepted at the University of New Hampshire, quit before I got there. I decided I'd be a mechanic in my uh, dad's small garage. And that didn't work out because I had no uh, capability when it came to mechanics. And I went out to Michigan deciding to be a uh, a carpenter with my uncle and learned I had no affinity at all for being a carpenter. And then I enlisted in the Navy to go for six years on a nuclear submarine. And the day before I was supposed to swear in, um, I called and said, uh, what happens if I don't show up tomorrow? And the uh, chief petty officer said, well, you know, you've made a commitment. This is going to be really difficult. You, it's not something that you can just get out of. And I thought about it for a moment and I thought, okay, maybe this was an indication that I knew how to ask questions as I thought about it for a moment and said, well, if I don't show up tomorrow, can you send the cops to the house to get me? And he hesitated a moment and said, no, I can't do that. I said, well, then I'm not coming. So I was August wondering what to do. I figured, okay, I'll just go back to school. And they wouldn't accept me because they said it had, uh, I had to reapply which made no sense to me. So I drove to, uh, they said they'd accept for January, not for the fall semester. So I drove to the University of New Hampshire with my long hair, uh, jeans and flannel shirt <clears throat> and parked myself in the director of admissions office and uh, told the secretary I wasn't leaving until I saw him for a couple of minutes, even if I walked to the car with him. So they had me sit there for a couple of hours, but eventually he saw me and what a nice guy. He said, if I filled out an application, he'd let me back in. So I did, got into school. Uh, after two years, the assistant dean of students called me to her office and said I'd no longer be allowed to live on campus because um, I was a general troublemaker. And I said, well, what exactly did I do? And she said, it's not one big thing. It just seems like wherever you are, there's trouble. So, okay, I was tired of never having any money. I decided to get a job working the second shift while I went to school during the day and did that for about six months. And then my buddy and I said, ah, we know the way to get rich here is we're going to be buy our own boat and be commercial fishermen off the coast of Maine. So I was going to school days, working nights and running a fishing boat. Something had to suffer and school did. So I got a 1-8 that semester, quit again. 
then uh, my buddy got married and his wife said, you're not going to keep fishing with that idiot friend of yours, are you? And so he had to say, no, he, uh, uh, you know, quit and we sold it, but we weren't making any money anyway. It was another thing I wasn't good at. And it seemed like everybody was getting married. So I did too. And first month we're married, I'm living in this third floor, unheated, uninsulated apartment in New Hampshire. So yes, it's chilly. And first month we're married, she says, uh, I'm pregnant. And I said, well, how's that possible? Uh, you know, I thought you were taking the pill. And she said, well, it's a pill, baby. I said, oh, okay. Fourth month, she says, I can't work anymore. And I did the analysis and found out um, based on my blue collar take home paycheck, we were spending two bucks a week more than I was making. And I looked at it, I had a hundred bucks in the bank and I figured, okay, I got 50 weeks to figure out what to do. I said, okay, the only thing I'm good at is school. So that was my epiphany. I always tell my oldest son, he's the reason I'm successful because he scared the bejesus out of me. I thought my kid's gonna die because I'm a screw up. And I can remember when he was born in February, bringing him home and I found myself taping up all the windows with masking tape and afraid he was gonna die because I was a screw off. And I have to say that motivated me. I've told him nothing has motivated me in my life like his pending birth. So that was my beginning. It was, like I said, a little directionless, as you can tell. But once I got direction, I was able to focus a bit and turn turn it into something. That's crazy. I, I feel like um, your personal story is just as fascinating as the story of like when you got to Honeywell. And we could have a whole conversation. <laughs> I have so many questions about everything that you just said. But I know a lot of people want to hear um, <laughs> about Honeywell. So one thing really quick before we move on to that, you mentioned that your, your parents instilled a lot of values that helped shape who you are as a leader. Can you share what some of those values were? And do you have any stories of how your parents made those values come to life? Oh, sure. Um, I'd probably say uh, the biggest one was, I know my mom used to always say, think for yourself whenever uh, I wanted to do something with my friends. My dad used to always say, be a leader, not a follower. Hey, my dad and said really the same thing. Yep, a different way, said the same thing. Uh, really irritating when you keep hearing it as a kid. Uh, but what you end up finding out as you get older, and I'm fond of saying, independent thinking is a lot more rare than being smart. There's all kinds of smart people out there who can explain to you why things are the way they are, use a thousand words to your 10 and sound very convincing, but they're not really thinking for themselves. They're just kind of parroting what uh, everybody else has said. And that ability to think was really important. Uh, working hard was another one. And uh, both my parents worked very hard. My mom raised uh, five kids and did uh, everything on her own. And at one point was raising 5,000 chickens at the same time. Wow. My dad, I don't think, worked less than 80 hours a week in the whole time we were growing up. And oftentimes more than that, because that's what he needed to do to uh, make ends meet. So hard work was instilled in all of us. And then a story that uh, stuck with me since I was... 12 or 14, I forget how old I was at the time. But um, my dad was uh, very proud and, and a tough guy. I mean, he, as a kid, you certainly didn't ask him a question twice. You asked once, whatever the answer was, that was it. You, you didn't pursue it. <laughs> and I can remember this, we're sitting on the curb, which was unusual. It meant that it was an ex extremely slow day and there was nothing left for me to clean. And I'm just uh, sitting there with him and we're kind of shooting the breeze, looking around and a customer pulls in and he greeted the customer with his usual cheery greeting, you know, how you doing, all that kind of stuff. And this customer was irate. He gets out of his car and he just starts yelling at my dad and yelling it away. I can hear it. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, he's going to pop him one. I can't, uh, I'm going to see it right here. It's going to happen right in front of me. So I'm going to keep my eyes open up to see this. My dad just kept saying, I'm sorry, I'll make it right. I'm sorry, I'll take care of it. And he just kept doing that until the customer was finally placated and uh, drove off. And my, as my dad came walking back, I, I wasn't going to say a word. I was just kind of staring off into space, you know, looking at him out of the corner of my eye. And he sat down and I'll always remember, he kind of looked off into space a little wistfully and he said, you know, Dave, 
sometimes in business and in life, you have to put your ego in your back pocket. Oh, no, sorry. You have to put your pride in your back pocket. Hmm. And man, that always stuck with me. And whenever I've had to do it myself, I thought, okay, this is the smart thing to do right now. Just, you know, do like my dad did. And I'd say the yeah. last one is my, my dad could be a pretty colorful guy. And he used to always say, start at the bottom, make sure you understand how things work. Cause that'll help you get to the top. And they would always add on to that. And just remember the higher up you climb the flagpole, the more people can see your ass. <laughs> 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 which was a good reminder to treat everybody with courtesy and respect. Yeah. Oh man. I, these are fantastic stories. Uh, so how did you go from, I mean, you were this, this young kid, you were scrambling, you were worried that your, your child's not going to have enough money working hard. And how did you go from that to being the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company? What, how, how did, what was that career path like? Cause most people wouldn't, <laughs> I mean, you, it doesn't seem like a natural progression. Uh, I wouldn't say it was to go from hourly employee for two and a half years running a punch press and other equipment to being the CEO of Honeywell isn't, a, I'd say, a typical career path. No. And becoming, yeah, becoming a uh, CEO, uh, that never even, that thought never even occurred to me until I was about 40 years old. So I'd say for the first uh, 17 years or so, I guess it would be, I just wanted the next job to pay more than the last one because I never wanted to live again like I had to for that first four or five years where every week I'd be figuring out which bills can I afford to pay and which can I afford to let slide. And I said, I, I don't want to live my life like this. I, could, I can't stand it. So whatever I did, I looked at it and said, okay, will this pay more? And does this help me uh, put me on a path where I can make more again? And I had my first general manager type position when I was, um, I guess it was about 40. And that's when I started thinking, gee, you know, I think I could probably do this as a CEO. It doesn't seem that hard compared to what I'm doing now. I should be able to have the skills to do it. And interestingly, I got all kinds of advice from friends, uh, business colleagues, uh, HR folks, all telling me not to try to become a general manager to begin with, because I was, I, I'd been in finance at that point. They said, you're good at finance. That's where you ought to stay. That's your career path. And it's another one where you have to be able to think independently, because I looked at it and said, yeah, okay, I, I think I am decent at finance, but I think I could be decent at something else also. And I don't want to be 60 years old and look back and say, uh, gee, I just didn't have the guts to find out whether I could do it or not. And I yeah. realized, okay, I need to think it through a little bit and say, am I willing to risk failure to find out? Because that's the decision you make. And I thought, okay, I think I can do this. But that evolution to getting to that point uh, was strictly one of if the next job will pay more and I need a job, I will take it. I I can't say I really started kind of general management CEO thoughtfulness until I was 40. Wow. Um, so before we jump into Honeywell, one more question for you. I know that there are a lot of people who are listening and watching who, you know, similar situation. They're, they're frustrated in their careers. Uh, maybe they feel stuck. They feel like there's not a very clear progression to go forward. What is it that allowed you to kind of see that there is a path forward? I mean, do you have any advice for people who maybe were in that similar position that you were in? Of, of I mean, what would you tell them? Yeah, I guess I would, um, I'd bucket it into a couple of different uh, areas. Uh, the first one is uh, you have to have performance. And your performance can't just be okay it's got to be like top 10%. Yep. So you have to look at it and say, okay, am I performing that way? Because I always used to say where someone went to school, all that kind of stuff, uh, that just made a difference with their first job. After yes. that, they had to perform. Yes. And, and not just you know make your commitments and be like everybody else, but you have to be a standout in your numbers and your performance. 
The second one is you need visibility. Somebody hmm. needs to see it. Somebody who can do something about your career. Now, you have to be careful. You don't want to wear your ambition on your sleeve, as the old saying goes. Constantly be tooting your own horn, talking about how great you are. But if you're in a position where nobody can see what it is you're doing, then that's going to hurt your advancement. Yes. Now, when it comes to a more personal side of it, two things I would point to there and kind of a takeoff on the what we just talked about. But some people think they're performing and their boss doesn't quite agree or thinks what they're doing is average compared to everybody else. And it's very easy for people to get sucked into the idea that as far as they're concerned, they're doing a great job. If their boss doesn't think they're doing a great job, then it's probably not going to get them very far. So people really need to re-examine, is it that I have a truly bad boss, which does happen, not yep. as often as people think, but it does happen, or is it me? Then the second piece of it, and a bit tied into this, is you have to be self-aware and you have to be a learner. And when mm -hmm. I say self-aware, this is something that uh, whether you're dealing with a particular situation and what's the best way to handle it, or what are the things that about you that you need to be aware of that are issues for you, uh, both end up being important. Because if you say, okay, I have a certain management style, this is what I use everywhere and everybody has to adapt to me, you're probably not going to be as successful as if you can figure out okay, how do I motivate each of the people that works for me in a way that works for them? Then when it comes to understanding yourself, this is one that takes some introspection. It's painful and it can take time. And I can say that it was when I was about 40 years old before some of those things finally dawned on me. And I'll give you the, uh, the big one was uh, I've been told since my first appraisal that I could be defensive, to which I would say, no, I'm not, not recognizing the irony of that. And then when I realized the irony of it, I used to take more words to explain how my boss was incorrect. But I was about 40 again, and I was in this uh, meeting with a bunch of peers. And um, one guy said something, I responded to him, and he said, geez, Dave, don't be so defensive. And I thought, okay, this is a chance to finally allay this misperception. And I turned to another friend of mine and said, so, I mean, do you consider me defensive? And he said, nah, Dave, you know, I wouldn't say you're defensive, but, you know, I would say that if we say something negative about your organization and we're not 100% correct, you will rip our lips off. <laughs> and <laughs> I just, wow. Okay, well, this is something I got to be aware of. So from that point on, and I can't say I, I had no relapses, but I became a lot more aware of it and said, if I'm going to make good decisions, I need to make sure people are a lot more comfortable with always telling me things, whether I like it or not, whether yeah. they're right or not. I have to learn to make sure that I have the right people around me who will tell me, and I have to make sure that I control my own emotions so that I don't react defensively. Yeah, As I, I think tell that's people, everybody's got them. You all got issues. You have to figure out what they are. And I always say it's a four block. There's like good advice, bad advice. You take it, you don't take it. Because not everything people tells you, tell you is going to be correct. They may just have an ax to grind. But you got to maximize the good advice you take and the bad advice you reject. I think that's wonderful advice. And I love that you mentioned there's no substitute for performance. I mean, you still need to do, you be great at what you do. Um, yep. So let's um, let's fast forward to Honeywell. You just take over as CEO. Can you give us a description of what was Honeywell like when you first started there? Like, do you remember your first day on the job as the CEO? Yeah, I do. Um, it was actually pretty easy because you do a lot of stuff with press and just say hi to employees. And so that was all uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, the part that came as a surprise to me was that I was the CEO and uh, that same day I was uh, instructed through the board that I was not to focus on any of the numbers or the financials. 
and until I was chairman four and a half months later to not look at any of the financials. Interesting. Which I thought okay. was a little weird. Yeah, yeah that's a little that's weird. Strange. But okay, you know, there's a point. Just kind of learn the businesses. But then it became extraordinarily weird when just like in the normal course of activity, you're talking to a finance guy and say, so how's the quarter going? And the finance guy looks at you and says, I'm sorry, Dave, I've been instructed not to answer any of those questions from you. Like, wow. OK, well, I thought I was the CEO, but <laughs> who is running this place? And I realized until I became chairman, it wasn't me. And when I became chairman and finally was able to see everything that was going on, it was then I realized that as bad as it looked externally, it was even worse internally. The aggressive bookkeeping was, I'd say, unhealthy to be a conservative. And you look at it over a previous decade, we only generated 69 cents of cash for every dollar of income we ever generated, which gives you a sense for the bookkeeping. No. We had a severely underfunded pension plan with, that also had aggressive accounting. We had environmental liabilities that a 100-year-old uh, chemical company has that had never been addressed nor recorded. And we had exposure to asbestos in uh, two areas, none of which had been recorded or addressed. And on top of that, we had an empty pipeline of product services geographies. We had three warring cultures. And I had a board I couldn't trust. And I had a staff I couldn't trust, three of whom who'd interviewed for my job. So it was uh, quite an uncomfortable place to find myself uh, and very lonely because, you know, who the heck do you talk to at that point? Yeah. Yeah. Man, that sounds like um, <laughs> a very unpleasant situation to be in. And I love that the board was hiding this from you until you became chairman, which is very bizarre. Um, so, well, I mean, they preferred to uh, they preferred to not know. Yeah. And. In one of the board meetings, I actually started to talk about uh, the accounting and what I needed to do. And I was pulled aside by one of the leading directors after the meeting and said, Dave, we never want to hear about that again in the board meeting. As far as we're concerned, if there's an issue, it's up to you to deal with it. Wow. So, ah, OK. And I know some people will look at it and say, it can't possibly be that bad. And I relate the story of this new litigation lawyer that we uh, hired, Kate Adams. And uh, I saw her to, to start handling all these lawsuits that we had for everything. And so I asked her, I uh, saw her in the hallway like six months afterwards. And I said, uh, so any buyer's remorse about uh, coming to Honeywell? And she said, no, this place is fascinating. I love Honeywell. We have just an extraordinary portfolio. I said, that's terrific. I agree with you. I, I think our businesses are underestimated in terms of what their capability could be. And she looked at me and said, oh, well, that too. But I'm actually talking about the portfolio of lawsuits. We get sued for everything, all kinds of stuff all over the world. It's absolutely fascinating. And I looked at her and said, you know, Kate, as a CEO, that's not exactly what I want to be proud of. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want to you don't want to tell too many people about that. Uh, okay, so you you get into the situation. It's clearly a toxic, a hostile environment. You can't really trust anybody. You don't really have anybody to talk to. So what do you do? What what were some of the first things that you did to change Honeywell into the amazing company that it is now? Well. Um... The first focus was I thought, I'm going to have to bring all these cultures together. We can't keep running this with warring cultures. And they even had a name for it. They called it the Red versus Blue Wars, the legacy Red Honeywell versus the legacy Blue Allied Signal. And then the legacy Pitway folks who had no color but didn't participate at all either way. So they actually had a name for it. And I thought, OK, I got to unite the culture. Every, they, all three of them wanted me to pick their culture as this is what we want to be. But I could see pluses and minuses to each. So we developed this amalgamation that we ended up calling the 12 behaviors. And I can okay. remember as we were trying to develop them, and I only spent a day or so with my staff uh, developing this. You know, I did a template, and then, not a template, but a, a, a draft. And then we all looked at it, worked at it together. And one of my 
uh, staff member said, geez, Dave, why are we spending all our time on behaviors and culture when we've got all these strategic issues we need to address? And I said, my response was, well, I can make all the strategic decisions you want, but if nobody does them, it really doesn't matter what I decided. Yeah. We need to have a culture where people work together and actually do what it is we say we're going to do. So that was number one. Uh, the second one was to just scrub all the bad business practices, all the bad accounting. And I told everybody, I want all this stuff out of the system within a year. No more distributor loading, no more cutting deals with suppliers for advanced payments you can book as income, no business sales you can book as income, no more accounting transactions that generate a bunch of income and no cash. All this stuff stops. And we focus on increasing sales and cutting costs. And that's how we're going to focus. Along with that, uh, I wanted to fill the pipeline and said, how do I get a pipeline, do the seed planting, if you will, when it came to geographic growth, product growth, service growth, and starting to focus on improving our processes. So those were kind of the big fundamental areas that I decided uh, uh, to focus on in order to turn the company around. What about the, the culture aspects? I would imagine that there were a lot of leaders who were pushing back against you when you wanted to make these changes. Uh, because this was probably financially uh, rewarding for them, like these these old outdated practices that they had in place. So how did you deal with leaders who were like, um, no, we're not going to change. We don't want to do that. Uh, what happened with the pushback? And did you get any, actually? Uh, I did, and it, it varied. So for uh, some, uh, they said right from the beginning, thank God, we, we think this is a ridiculous way to run the company. Uh, glad to get rid of this. There were others who uh, uh, looked at it and said, no, this is the right way to do it. We've always done it this way, whether they and, and more corporate types than the, the business types. And then you had the folks in the middle. And it was kind of interesting because you'd get a call at the end of the quarter saying something like, hey, boss, you know, I can make the number, but I need to do this. And I know you've said not to do that. So what do you want me to do? And I'd say that's when it, uh, you're in the crucible at that point, because writing all the values down, writing all the behaviors down, that's the easy part. The tough part is when you get to, do you walk the talk? Do you stick with the investment in the seed planting that you talked about? Do you not allow them to do the accounting transaction or the distributor load? And those are the ones where I can say uh, to a fault maybe, I never succumbed on any of them. And, and I, I would tell them, I want you to make it. You still have to figure out how do you either sell more or cut cost, but I am not going to do this. And if you miss it, you miss it, but it's on you. And I made sure I put in audit practices to make sure that none of this stuff happened. But it's easy to know whether the accounting happened. Distributor loading is yeah. a little tougher. You've got to do a little more work to find out uh, was that happening. But once hmm. employees start to see you walk the talk, that's what starts to change the culture. You can have all kinds of posters and all that, but posters don't do it. People need to actually see that it's working that way. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. Um, so in your case, it sounded like there needed to be quite a big culture change. And you actually have one story in your book. I think it was during um, during a meeting and somebody gave you like 150 page document, like a presentation they put together? Oh, yeah. Well, that, that happened more than once. And, uh, and then, but the, this one was particularly notable because rather than just express a kind of facial frustration, uh, this guy actually took the time to take me to task on it. And, yes. Yeah, because... Uh, I mean, the whole place was set up to just uh, presentations were a performance and you kind of listen to the performance and applauded and said, great job, go make it happen. And then everybody kind of put everything away and never thought about it again. And I couldn't remember it because it was this one business, this one leader uh, had several of those kinds of run ins. And I can remember having a strategic discussion at one point where I said, I want to understand our uh, strengths and issues. 
and we started with a strengths page and they had like 15 or 20 strengths listed on there. And we spent maybe 30 seconds on it and they flipped the page to go to the next one. And I said, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. I said, okay, this first one, tell me what this means and why is it a strength? And they went through it and I went back and forth with what about the competition? What it came out to, well, I guess it's not really a strength. It's a capability that we have. I said, yeah, but it's not a competitive difference because everybody else can do this too, right? Yes. All right, well, let's go to the next one. Well, by the time we got to the third one, that same business leader was like, Dave, you know, if we keep this up, we're never going to get through the pitch. And I was, well, uh, you know, this is critical. If we're going to understand truly what are the strate strategic strengths and weaknesses of the business, we need to understand what the heck they are. And right now, from what I can see, we don't understand what they are. So we got to spend the time to figure it out. And another time he objected because uh, I was bouncing around like I do. I'd ask a question and they'd say, uh, uh, well, well, we'll cover that on uh, later. And I'd say, okay, well, uh, what page? And they'd say like page 37. So we go to page 37 and say, well, you know, it doesn't really cover it. This is what my question is. And what you found was they just had all these ways of just kind of postponing all, all the difficult questions to just kind of get through the pitch. And that's the way a lot of them looked at it, is you just want to get through yeah. this and be done with it. Then you don't do anything. You just kind of put it all aside. So he literally told me, uh, Dave, you know, I got to object to how you're handling this conversation because we've put a lot of time and thought into this presentation. So I had to take a moment and I said, well, I guess it depends what the point of the presentation is, is if it's for me to watch a show, yes, I should just sit here passively. If it's for me to learn about your business and for me to be able to be helpful at points in the future, then we ought to run this presentation based on how do I learn best? And the way I would learn right now is if you answered my questions right now, instead of making me wait and have to remember it. Yeah. Well, as you might imagine, uh, that leader didn't last that much longer after that. Um, why didn't you quit? So when you found out that all this was happening and you got put into this position, why didn't you just say, screw you guys, I'm out of here? Why did you decide to stay uh, when you had basically the, 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 car, the cards, the deck was stacked against you? I mean, they made it as hard as they possibly could to turn this company around. Why did you decide to go through with it? Well, I guess uh, for a couple of reasons is uh, one, uh, good or bad, I'm a finisher. So whatever I start, even if it's a book I don't like, uh, I finish it. And like I said, it can be bad too, because whatever's on my plate, I'll have a tendency to finish that too. So uh, it's, it's a good and bad uh, item. I'd say the second one is um, I was going into this without a good reputation already. I was okay. considered, um, gee, didn't make it to the first tier in the GE succession race. Uh, wasn't even the first choice to run Honeywell, both of which were true. And I remember it was on CNBC at one point, the, the um, uh, reporter said, we're not sure this company can be turned around. And if it can, we're not sure this is the guy to do it because he didn't make it to the first tier of GE succession and wasn't the first choice to run Honeywell. So I'd say I was in kind of a corner myself and regardless of the circumstances, probably the smartest thing for me to do was to do what I did. And that's okay. Try to figure it out. Yeah. Okay. No, makes sense. Um, how do you define leadership? Well, uh, I break it into three pieces that I say are necessary for somebody to be a good leader. Uh, the first one is the ability to mobilize, motivate a large group of people. Uh, I'll also say it's the most visible, but it's only 5% of the job. Motivating okay. a large group of people isn't that hard. And you could do it a number of different ways. It's not just a great speech. It's uh, how you act, the way you conduct yourself. There's a number of ways to, to do it. But a lot of people will look at a, somebody who gives a great speech and say, oh man, that person's a great leader. And they don't realize, no, they're just a great orator. It doesn't mean they're a great leader at that point. The yeah. next two are the really big steps. The second step 
is can you pick the right direction? And too many leaders can sound great. They do the fad surfing. They can be very conversant on whatever the hot topic is out there. But do they make the right decisions to put an organization on the right path in the right direction? And I oftentimes say, if you spend, you got everybody motivated, and then you spend 40 years wandering in the desert, you're probably not a good leader. That's not a, a you're, not, you're not good for the organization. Uh, kind of a corollary to that is that um, one of the most undervalued things a leader does, but one of the most valuable things a leader does is avoid trouble in the first place. Mm. And the press gives no credit to leaders for avoiding a problem because yeah. it's not noticeable. It's not news. Uh, they, a lot more attention is paid to the company or the leader who gets into trouble. And then if they can get themselves out of it, well, that's an additional story. Yeah. But the leader who avoids all that trouble, you never, never hear about it. The third piece, and this is just as important, is you've mobilized everybody. You've picked the right direction. Can you now get the entire organization moving step by step in that direction? And I still think there are still too many leaders who think, look, I make the big decisions and then I have great people and they, they make it happen. Yeah. Well, I like to say there's a difference between delegation and abdication. And that's abdication. With delegation, you find ways to verify for yourself are things happening out there the way you think they are? And you make sure that whatever you decide to do truly has a logical implementation path, that you're not trying to be too broad, you're not under-resourced, but you've picked the right focal points, resourced them right, and then you have a, an independent way of finding out, is it working that way? And that's why I spent five, 600 hours a year on the plane traveling around the world. I mean, I visited uh, over 100 countries and visit customers, go with sales guys, do town halls, factory visits, just to see are things happening the way I'm hearing they are. Yeah. And it's important when you do that to look for falsification bias instead of confirmation bias. And leaders, once you've made a decision, all of us have a tendency to see all the facts aligned consistent with that decision. They're just all, all that much more obvious to us than they were before. Well, while that can be good, as a leader, what you need to be looking for are what are those facts that are inconsistent with my having made a good decision here that just don't quite fit? Am I missing something? Was there something about my decision that isn't right? And leaders need to be looking for that falsification bias constantly. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, of course, I have to ask because there's a lot of change happening in the world now, uh, you know, with things like Black Lives Matter, with COVID. Are you seeing leadership change? Have you seen leadership change over the past few months as a result of what's happening in the world now? Um, I don't think what's required to be a good leader changes over time. And if you went back and said, OK, so how did Julius Caesar lead? versus uh, how did to today's leaders lead, I think you'd find that a lot of the leadership qualities they had were the same because you're dealing largely with human nature when you're doing this. And that doesn't change all that much over the uh, millennia. Uh, that also means that leaders need to adapt. Leaders need mm -hmm. to evolve. And it's a, a, always a big focus with me was that whether you're a company, an organization, a country or a person, you had to evolve, whether it's learning how to be more self-aware about yourself, uh, your company and the things that you're focused on, your country and the things that it's focused on. You have to keep evolving. And this is definitely a point of evolution. And every, uh, every company, every leader has to be able to adapt to it, understand it and do the right things. Yep. Uh, you have a section in your book where you talk about leading through tough times. Uh, can you share any stories about some of the tough times that you had to lead through and what you did to be able to get through those times? Well, I'd have to say the toughest one was the, you know, the Great Recession of uh, 2008, 2009. Yep. And that was uh, uh, quite painful. And as I like to say about 
uh, recessions, uh, they're all slightly different. And every time we have one, we think it's the worst ever. And usually we say that because we're in the middle of it then and it's quite painful. And, uh, you know, you look at 2001 and it was the plane crash and, oh, my God, how unique is this? Now we end up we end up with a great recession and the financial calamity. Oh, my God, how unique is this? Now we end up in COVID with a healthcare crisis. Oh, my God, how unique is this? And yeah, you have to at some point say to yourself, well, I guess there is an aspect of uniqueness to every recession you deal with. Uh, that being said, they're all alike in that the actions you need to take in order to survive it and the kind of leadership you need to provide uh, are the same. Uh, that doesn't change over time. And I could also add uh, every recession sucks and everybody needs to you need to know it as a leader is just right from the beginning. Uh, you're confronted with two options for everything, one bad, one less bad. And I used to tell folks all the time when they'd say, God, I'm working harder than ever. And for all, at an unbelievably less rewarding time. And all I could say is that's right. And that's why they call it a recession and they don't call it a party. It's not fun. But if we do the right things in the middle of a tough time, that will cause us to come out a much stronger company than our competitors. And the advice that I uh, give to people is to, one, don't panic. Uh, two, make sure that you keep thinking independently as we uh, talked about before. Yep. Three, never forget to put your customer first. Don't let customer service suffer in, uh, in any way. And four, four is be thinking about the recovery even while you're in the middle of the recession. Because when you're in the middle of a recession, it's very easy to start thinking it's going to be like this forever. My life is horrible. The economy's horrible. Nothing's ever going to be good again. And this is one where I rely on history and say, well, you know, in our, the 240 years that we've been a country, despite every bad recession we've had, good times do come back. So yeah. how do you make sure you don't lose sight of that and that you manage to think about, OK, how am I preparing for the recovery in this tough time? And there's this old saying I've always been fond of that says, when you're up to your button alligators, it's tough to remember the original goal was to drain the swamp. So if you're a leader, you feel like you are covered in alligators. You've got 120 hours worth of work, 80 hours to get it done. And you're sitting there going, Dave, I hear what you're saying, but for crying out loud, I'm just trying to survive right now. I don't have enough time to think about the recovery. And this is where I say, this is where good leaders separate from mediocre leaders because a good leader finds a way to take at least a couple hours a week to put their head above the fray and look around and say, okay, all these short-term actions I'm taking, is it going to make a difference for where I'm trying to go for the long term? Is it consistent with what I'm trying to do? And if it's not, what do I do differently so that it will be? Those are the people who will do well going into the recovery and truly distinguish yeah. themselves. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, so taking time to sort of look big picture, it sounds like is kind of the, the idea there. Um, now, the, the title of your book is obviously all about succeeding in the short term while planning and also succeeding in the long run. And of course, there's a lot of criticism from uh, just the public in general that a lot of CEOs, a lot of business leaders tend to only just be obsessed with quarterly profits, quarterly numbers, uh, financial metrics. Can you talk a little bit about why, why that's the case? I mean, how can you succeed at both, uh, you know, execute on the short run, but also think big picture, think about what's going to happen several years down the road? Well, uh, one of the reasons I wrote the book is to uh, address the point that you're bringing up, which is a lot of leaders and uh, a lot of the press uh, tee this up as a choice. You either choose yeah. to be short term or you choose to be long term. And I always felt like and the way we ran Honeywell was along this theme that success is about accomplishing two seemingly conflicting things at the same time. Do you want low inventory or great customer service? Do you want people closest to the action empowered for quick decisions or do you want good control so nothing bad happens? Do you want good short-term results or do you want good long-term results? And once you start looking for it, you see this um, kind of principle everywhere. So 
I figured you have to do both. And the reason you need to do both is if you're not investing in the long term, eventually the long term becomes the short term and then you're yeah. out of gas. You've got nothing. You've got nothing that you've done. None of the seed planting that's going to allow you to be successful. The tougher one for people to understand is that performance in the short term is a validation of is your long term plan any good? Does it make any sense at all? And if uh, somebody says, hey, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be a real problem for three years, but then it's going to be great. Neither your boss nor your investors are ever going to say, oh, great, you know, we'll see you in three years. Yeah, they've got to see something. So you have to figure out how do you create those short term accomplishments that are consistent with where you're going for the long term. And that's why my whole point was uh, I needed to generate income flexibility so that I could generate the returns that would satisfy investors and do better than my competitors. But at the same time, give me the flexibility to invest do the seed planting in the long term. And that's why I focus so much on growing sales and holding fixed costs constant, because that gave me all kinds of margin flexibility to accomplish both. Hmm. So these are not opposing forces. You don't just have to pick one or the other. I think it's a mistake if you pick one or the other. And I oftentimes said uh, one of the most deadly questions to respond to is when an employee says something like, hey, boss, which one do you want me to do? And the answer always has to be, I expect you to do both. I want things right and I want them fast. So I don't want it to be, I have to choose between the two. I want you to always find a way to accomplish both. Yeah, okay, makes sense. Um, one of the sections in your book was titled, get and keep the right leaders, but not too many of them, which, uh, <laughs> which I thought was a very, very interesting section in the book. So can you talk a little bit about that? What do you mean when you say don't keep too many of them? Well, uh, let's start with what we were able to do at Honeywell. As you pointed out, we went from a 20 billion in market cap to 120. We took our sales from about 22 to about 42. And when we started at 22 and were considered a lean company, Wall Street considered us a lean company, uh, we had 740 of what we call leaders, executive band and above. And how many total uh, employees? Uh, that would have been out of 115,000. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. 16 years later, uh, we had a company that was 42 billion in sales. We had about 135,000 employees and we only had 650 leaders. Hmm. So at the same time, we doubled the company, went up about 20% in headcount. We actually reduced the number of leaders by 15%. And it didn't happen on what one fell swoop. We just kind of did it steadily over time. But I felt it was important for two reasons. The first one is uh, they do add cost. Uh, the cost of the leader, cost of the staff, getting an executive assistant, all that stuff does add cost. But that's the kind of visible and smaller cost. The biggest cost is that if you create a position for a leader and give them something good to do that looks like it makes a lot of sense, they will generate a lot of work. And all of it will sound good. All of it will involve all the other leaders. So what you end up with is a bunch of leaders working for each other, very internally focused, instead of focusing externally on what do you do? How do you do the right thing for the customer? What are the right things there? How do I just make my internal processes better? So I'm a big believer in have, have fewer of them. And I, I really think that most large U.S. companies would benefit from fewer leaders. Hmm. Okay, so it sounds like this was a very conscious decision, a conscious effort. And so does fewer leaders oh, just yes. mean that... Okay, so does each leader just have a bigger team? Are they just responsible for more people? Because uh, some might say that's hard to do too. 
I guess they would have a few more people, but uh, we were able to double the size of the company without adding that much uh, when it came to employment because we were making our processes better. Hmm. And you can tell with uh, just the number of leaders and the size of the business, it's not like we were super expanding spans of control. It wasn't anything crazy. We weren't saying, okay, you used to have eight direct reports. Now you have 25. Uh, we didn't do any of that because I, I thought I'd seen that approach get gained too easily. I mean, a lot of those metrics, stuff like um, 50% of your sales have to come from products introduced in the last three years. Your spans of control have to go from 10 to 15. Uh, all those kinds of metrics are easily gamed by the organization. Yeah. And I'm fond of saying, you know, a lot of people say what gets measured gets done. Uh, what I'm fond of saying is uh, if you measure something, the metric will get better because mm. organizations learn how to manipulate the metric. Unless you've got some way of auditing it, you've defined exactly what you're looking for. Organizations learn what I also refer to as compliance with words as opposed to compliance with intent. Yeah. And organizations are very good at complying with the words so that everybody's happy. The leader sees the metric improve. They feel good because, you know, they got something done. Uh, all the employees are happy because the boss is happy and they don't have to screw around with this thing anymore. And in the reality of it is the customer or whoever's supposed to benefit from this is no better off than they were when they started. Hmm. We only have a, a few minutes left, so I want to touch a, a few minutes on culture. And you had a great story in the book about how culture saved you $25 million. So first, I wanted you to talk about how, how do you define culture? Um, and can you share the story of how it saved you $25 million? Yeah, I'd say um, one of the ways to define culture, this is kind of a takeoff on um, something that somebody else has said in the past, but it's how do people act when you're not looking? So I always felt like there are tens of thousands of decisions going on in the company every day that I have nothing to do with. And if people have a sense for, here's how I'm supposed to act in these kind of situations. Not that they know, okay, if this happens, that happens, I go do this. But that they know how to think about things so that you have more of a thinking company. Then more of those decisions are going to break your way all the time. And people will do the right thing for the customer, for the company, just because they know that's what you're uh, looking for. And that's how I guess might be an easy way to define culture is just think about it as how do people act when you're not measuring them, not looking at them, but they, you know, they, they know what it is to do. And I'd say the uh, saving the 25 million, this is a, a good example. Uh, I'd say of my own self-awareness, it was helpful. Not that I'm always good at <laughs> self-awareness, but uh, certainly in this case I was. And what I did to kind of change my own approach to things. And this is an important part of our culture was people being self-aware of their impact on others and uh, kind of their own issues. And uh, most people would say I'm decisive. Well, most people would also say if you're a leader, decisiveness is a great thing. Well, yes and no. If you're dealing with little stuff, yeah, decide it, move on, don't get caught up with it. If you're dealing with big stuff that has irreversible consequences, you wanna take your time. Take as much time as you're allowed. Being decisive can actually hurt you. And in this case, we were looking at the sale of a business and we went through the whole thing and it was, it was a business losing money that we were going to lose money on the sale also. So it was something that I just needed to have out of the portfolio because it was never going to help our stock price. And it was difficult to sell. So we went through everything and I needed to make a decision by like Friday. So this was on a Tuesday. We went through the whole thing. 
And I said, okay, uh, we'll proceed. But this is a preliminary decision. And this is one where I had to control myself again because uh, it's something I had to learn to say, make a preliminary decision, allow people, including me, to ruminate over it, then get back together on the final day and decide. Uh, and I said, okay, we'll make a final decision on Friday when we need to. And I was going to be in China, so I was going to have to do it late at night on a teleconference call. So we get to Friday, and I said, all right, let's uh, go through the whole thing again. And, of course, there's objections on the phone. Like, wait a minute, we just went all over this stuff. I said, yeah, I know, I know, but this is part of my learning is we need to do this just to make sure we're making the right decision. So we go through the whole thing and come to find out the way the finance guys looked at something. Uh, they thought they were being clear. They were not. And what we all thought was going to be a $50 million loss on sale was going to be a $75 million loss on sale. At which point I said, wait a minute. Okay. I never understood this before and come to find out neither nobody else around the table did. Of course, the finance guys were upset, feeling like we were calling them liars when we we're saying, no, you just look at the world differently than we do. So you segmented this loss thinking it's obvious to everybody and it's not. And I said, okay, this is worse than I thought. We're not going to do this deal. And a lot of pushback from around the table that no, just get it done. And I said, no, not, not going to do it. This is too big a loss. Uh, I'm not going to do it. Well, four months later or so, uh, that same buyer came back and did do the deal with us. And based on what it was we had originally expected as a loss. So because I was willing to kind of put myself and everybody else through that additional work, which was a focus of our culture and an important part of my own self-awareness, in four months, we made 25 million bucks, which is not a, you know, not a bad way to spend your time. No, no, not at all. Um, all right, very last question for you before you wrap up uh, and ask you where people can go, can go grab your book. Uh, if you were to think back during the course of your career or your life, what one moment do you think most shaped either your career or your approach to leadership? Was there a specific thing that you can think of? Huh. Um, I can't say that it was any particular leadership lesson. I would say uh, if I had to pick one, I'd probably say it's when I was uh, fired by Jack Welch from GE because that whole time, uh, I always said they did a great job of teaching everybody there. Uh, you never want to leave because it's cold outside. All yeah. the best people in the world come here. All the people who couldn't make it here are at those other companies. So you don't want to go there. And I always thought that was a really strong part of the culture that kind of kept it together is people didn't want to leave. Well, all of a sudden I was confronted with uh, having to go. And uh, I was offered the opportunity to stay in a lesser job. Uh, and I took that, though, as a time to say, okay, I'm, I'm finally, this gives me the opportunity to find out, can I do it or not? Yep. So I'm going to go after this thing, hammer and tong to figure out, can I? And I would say being fired was a turning point for me. And that's why I always tell people when, you know, a bad thing happens in their career, uh, this doesn't mean it ends. This just means you got hit and you got to stand up and run again. Yeah. Just figure plus, out, make sure you're running in the right direction. Yeah. And being fired by Jack Welsh is a, is a cool story for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was really weird because, uh, you know, I had to go to his office for dinner. And I mean, first words out of his mouth are, Dave, I want you out of the company by year end. And this is June of 99. Wow. And I said, uh, okay, well, what did you see that you didn't like or didn't see that you wish you had? And his voice just got even higher. And he said, you don't understand. I want you out of the company by year end. I said, no, I understand. I'm a big boy, but um, I think I'm better than you think I am. And if there's something I need to address, I'd like to know what it is. And his voice elevated again. And he just said, you don't understand. You have to be out of the company by year end. 
I said, all right, all right, I got it. <laughs> you know, and he said, I'll be helpful to you as I can, which was nice, but you're out of the company by year end. Hmm. Okay. So I did. I never did find out, by the way. Interesting. Man, you have, so, I, if you write another book, it should just be like a memoir of personal stories because you have so many, <laughs> I, I feel like they could make a movie about your your experiences and all the stuff that you've gone through. I mean, it's it's really amazing and fascinating. I wish we could talk for another hour. Um, but where I'm can glad, people- I'm glad uh, it's interesting. Some of it was fun. Some of it was painful. I can tell you that. Yeah, but I mean, you know, I mean, these experiences of just uh, interacting with Jack Welsh, working there, Honeywell, and the situation you were brought into, um, you know, your childhood, how you grew up when you were younger. I mean, it's just, it's- it, it almost reads like a hero's journey, just going through a bunch of different, um, you know, different challenges, which is fantastic and, and really, really amazing. Uh, but where I'm can we go? Kind, Jacob, and I, I, but I do appreciate it. I hope the book oh, comes I, across that interesting for everybody. Yeah, look, I've interviewed uh, probably five, 600 people on this podcast. And I got to say, you know, not everybody has a really fascinating and interesting story. And part of at least what <laughs> intrigues me isn't just you know, the present day business aspect of a leader, but it's also how they got to where they are, what shaped them as a human being, as a leader. And I think you have a lot of really cool things to share there. Uh, so thank you oh, for thank that. You. Um, where can people go to learn more about you and where can people go to grab this book? Anything that you want to mention for people to check out, please feel free to do so. Uh, sure. I've got a uh, LinkedIn site. For the first time in my life, I'm on social media, or as you might imagine, as a CEO, I did everything I could to avoid it. Uh, Welcome to the dark we, side. Uh, had this, <laughs> once we had this book, it seemed a, uh, a good thing to do. So there's regular postings there that's worth looking at. And of course, uh, the book should be at a any bookseller, at Barnes & Noble, a Amazon, etc. cetera. Uh, so you can find it online very easily. Very cool. Well, David, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to speak with me. I really appreciate it. Well, you made it fun, Jacob. Thanks. Oh, my pleasure. And thanks everyone for tuning in. My guest again, David Cody. Last name is C-O-T-E if you're looking for his book on Amazon. And the book is called Winning Now and Winning Later. Thank you everybody for joining me and I will see you next time. See ya.